my name is Harshad and today we have with us Professor Vinay Lal. He's a cultural critic basically and a writer and a blogger, a professor from University of California, Los Angeles. And he has been widely writing on contemporary issues. And because of the time constraint, I should shorten my introduction. I think we can straight away go to his lecture and he'll be talking to you for 45 minutes and after that last 15 minutes we'll be having an interaction section. We'll take some questions from the audience and uh, I welcome uh, Professor Vinay Lal. Welcome sir, welcome to Calif and welcome to Cori Court. I would like to request him to give his lecture on Ambedkar and religion. Is this on now? Okay, good. Um, I'd like to begin by, uh, by thanking uh, uh, KLF for uh, the invitation and for its hospitality. Uh, as has been mentioned to you, what I'm going to speak about today is uh, Ambedkar, uh, uh, religion and Islam. Um, and what I have to say today is probably going to make uh, everyone unhappy. It's going to make the Dalits unhappy. It's going to make Orthodox Hindus unhappy. Uh, Muslims, uh, liberals, uh, nearly everyone I can think of. Every constituency will have some reason to grumble uh, at the end of this talk. Uh, we are obviously speaking at a moment which, to use a cliched word, which I have lots of reservations about, is a moment of crisis. I say cliched because uh, let me remind you that what Walter Benjamin said that if you are a thinking person, you're always in a moment of crisis. The very act of thought induces crisis. Ethical action always leads to crisis of some kind. So I don't think it's very particularly useful when we use words like that to describe uh, our times. What I'm going to attempt to do is the following. I'm going to essentially divide my talk in four parts. Uh, the first is to try to establish very briefly the centrality of religion in the life of B.R. Ambedkar. The sec secondly, to understand why Buddha not Marx. Buddha not Marx is also the title of a, an essay by Ambedkar. Uh, there was a book that was in the works. So the manuscript has never really been discovered. Uh, but we have, we have a, a, a considerable fragment of it. The third part of it will be to attempt to understand how Ambedkar actually looked at Buddhism in the Indian past and what were actually the shortcomings of his understanding of Buddhism, which were very considerable. I want to suggest to you, partly because he was relying, if you read the book, the Buddha and his Dharma, or the Buddha and his Dhamma, the Pali word, and if you look at the, the sources at the end of it, you find that he relies largely on the Pali canon. There are a huge number of non-Pali sources, which give us a very different reading of the social structure of ancient India. And that's one of the big problems in Ambedkar's understanding of Buddhism. And finally, I will speak about his very critical attitude towards Islam. All right. So that's basically, essentially, the outline of what I want to suggest. And I want you to think about a number of things that follow. I mean, I should be saying that at the end, but I want to put it out right at the very beginning. One of which is that I think his whole embrace of Buddhism and his own rationale for embracing Buddhism has to be revisited. And of course I'm familiar with the argument that his Buddhism was not exactly the Buddhism of the Buddha, obviously. We know that he coined the word Navayana, the new way. I'm familiar with all of that. I'm sure that those of you who are familiar with Buddhism know exactly that. But nonetheless, it is a form of Buddhism. Secondly, let it, put, let it be put very bluntly, Ambedkar has very little, if anything, to contribute 
to the question of Hindu Muslim unity. All the people who are protesting, which I think is extraordinary, I think it's fantastic, right? Because I am firmly opposed, and I've written about that widely in the last two months in a number of publications to the CA, NCR, NPR, but more broadly, state authoritarianism. That's what we really. Notwithstanding all of that, the question is whether Ambedkar's writings themselves, for example, lend anything to the question of Hindu-Muslim unity. Um, and I want to suggest to you that he actually has very little to contribute, if anything, towards that. Uh, and I think we should understand that his, thirdly, that his critical attitude towards Islam was shaped by a certain predisposition towards a certain kind of modernity. In other words, if you look at it from the vantage point of today, he takes up the question which has animated a lot of people who have been looking at the question of Islam in the modern world. And there is a school of thought which argues, I don't really support that school, but that's a very long question which is outside the purview of my talk today. And that is a school of thought which holds to the view that Islam and modernity are not compatible. Okay? Uh, and in fact, that is Ambedkar's default view, that they are not compatible. Right? So that is, again, where I think that we, we have to begin to really question what Ambedkar was saying. There is no doubt in my mind that in the majority of quarrels, wrote a famous Indian, the Hindus come out second best. My own experience but confirms the opinion that the Muslim as a rule is a bully and the Hindu as a rule is a coward. These rather querulous words belong to Mohandas Gandhi, writing at the tail end of the Khilafat movement at a difficult moment of the struggle for Hindu-Muslim unity, but they could just as easily have come from the pen of B.R. Ambedkar, whose withering critiques of Hindu caste society have are now part of the common sense of the liberal and secular Hindu worldview, but whose views on Islam, and more specifically on the history of Indian Muslims, have received little critical scrutiny. It goes without saying that Ambedkar was predisposed, and for very good reasons, towards viewing nearly everything from the standpoint of the Dalits. His observations at the first roundtable conference in London held between November 1930 and January 1931 are telling in this respect. The depressed classes, I quote, welcome the British as their deliverers from age-long tyranny and oppression by the Orthodox Hindus. They fought their battle against the Hindus, the Muslims, and the Sikhs, right? The Dalits, and won for them this great empire of India, end quote. This, but the particular manner in which Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs are without any fanfare merely placed in opposition, not opposition, in opposition to each other points to Ambedkar's own priorities and the historical and philosophical viewpoint from which he assessed the Indian past. He earmarked the Hindu, as we know, as the eternal and mortal foe of the Dalits, their unrepentant and degenerate oppressor, but for reasons that he would himself delve into here and there, he found it difficult to embrace Sikhs and Muslims as brothers bound together in a fellowship of suffering. Now, Ambedkar was, of course, a serious student of history and politics. But what I want to suggest to make my first argument is that though it is not fashionable to speak of him in this vein, he was a man of intense religiosity a man of intense religiosity. He is associated with his to Hindus infamous pronouncement that he had been born a Hindu but would not die as one. Though of course the fact of his conversion to Buddhism, to which I shall advert later, is well known, his remark has often been interpreted as a sign of his disavowal of religion altogether. Indeed, there have been attempts to sequester him into the camp of Marxism, and there was much in Marx's worldview that he admired. However, his concern for the oppressed 
and his championing of the idea of equality do not suffice to turn him into a Marxist. What is rather more striking is Ambedkar's lifelong quest for spiritual fulfillment. Though here again, this scarcely comports with the public view. And you know that the public view of Ambedkar has essentially, is essentially two-pronged. One is the framer of the Indian Constitution. You know, the thousands of statues that you see of Ambedkar, that's what it is. He's holding the Constitution. And of course, the second is the, the trenchant critic of Hindu orthodoxy, of the caste and all of that. Right? But this view that I am suggesting does not comport very easily with this predominant view. That is where I'm saying that he's a man, actually, uh, who is uh, not simply a lawgiver, uh, the Moses of modern India, but a figure, actually, of religious contemplation. Right? Now, secondly, Ambedkar was not content to only abandon Hinduism. And this is a corollary of what I'm, of course, saying but found it necessary to embrace another religion. Ambedkar is not a free thinker. He's not an atheist. He's not an agnostic. He's not a non-believer. He rejects one religion, but finds it necessary to embrace another. He found it impossible to think of a life of fulfillment either for himself or for his people outside religion. As he declared before his followers at a speech on 18th March 1956, and I quote, without religion, our str struggle will not survive. Later that year in October, just two months before his passing in October, where he had led half a million um, uh, Dalits, mainly Mahars, um, it, to conversion, uh, to embrace Navayana, right? Um, just two months later, he does this. Now, scholars have been very much interested in how Ambedkar's Buddhism differs, as I've suggested to you, from the more conventional forms of Buddhism that we are familiar with. And that is a very long scholarly foray that one can go into, but this is just something for you to think about. That when we think about this, we also have to ask, why is it? And I'm going to take this up only very, very incidentally. Why is it that he doesn't convert to Christianity? Sikhism or to Islam, right? What might have led him, considering the country's circumstances, to embrace a religion that had but few followers in India at that time and could not offer the security of numbers, right? Now, Ambedkar was unequivocally clear about how religion had shaped him and the place it was destined to occupy in the liberation of Dalits. Character is more important than education. I'm quoting him. This is from a gathering of depressed class youth at a conference of untouchable railway workers in February 1938. And then they, he adds the following instructive phrases after that. It pains me to see youths growing indifferent to religion. Religion is not an opium as it is held by some. You know what, who this is a reference to. Right? What good things I have in me or whatever have been the benefits of my education to society, I owe them to the religious feelings in me. I want religion, but I do not want hypocrisy in the name of religion, end quote. In passing, at least, it is impossible to escape the observation that word to word, in Ambedkar's injunction to the young could have come from the mouth of Gandhi. Exactly these words could have come from Gandhi's mouth. Right? Right? And here again, there's a whole spate of questions which I have to leave aside, which is the relationship of Gandhi to Ambedkar, because of course we know that one of the few people in this country two decades ago, three decades ago rather, who attempted to offer a very different reading was Nagaraj of this particular relationship, you know, between Gandhi um, and uh, Ambedkar, all right? Now, as I've suggested to you, know, we, we know who's being targeted with these words when he said that religion is not an opium as it is held by some. There is a very considerable strand of work on Ambedkar that uncomfortable as it is with this attachment to religion, 
laboriously struggles to locate his religiosity within the matrix of liberalism. What is hereby obscured, to take one illustration, is the extent to which Ambedkar committed himself, and you'll be very surprised to hear this, to the accoutrements of institutionalized religion. He undertook a visit to Sri Lanka in 1950 with the express purpose of witnessing a Buddhist ceremonial. As he explained at a public gathering, and I quote, ceremonial is an important part of religion. Whatever rationalist might say, ceremonial is a very essential thing in religion, end quote. If the Buddha slayed ritual, and the rituals of the Vedas were odious to him, Ambedkar nonetheless saw the place of ritual in creating a commonality of sojourners, even, I would say, a sense of citizenship that far exceeds liberalism stand, st stayed, if not platitudinist, understanding of citizenship, right? That essentially one of the reasons why Buddha endorses ceremonial is because he thinks of it as actually constitutive of citizenship, as one of the steps that's constitutive of it. He crafted a set of rituals that would constitute the diksha ceremony for those seeking to enter the portals of Navayana. All right. Now, I have a section here which I'm going to omit where I essentially look very briefly at Ambedkar's relationship to Kabir uh, and why he did not embrace uh, the path of uh, bhakti. Uh, but you might want to think about the rejection of ceremonials and rituals in bhakti sex, particularly, for example, if you look at the Kabir, uh, Kabir Panthis. Um, he also, to just continue in this vein very briefly, uh, did not see bhakti cults as immune from the poisonous contamination of caste. That is one reason why he eventually doesn't move in that you know, particular direction. Um, but he also shares, and this has to do with something that has bothered me about Ambedkar for a very long period of time, which I cannot really get into except to really suggest to you, which is the, uh, Ambedkar's commitment to a certain form of positivist knowledge. Uh, so for example, the whole 19th century, late Indian 19th century Indian nationalist view of bhakti as effeminate, as having produced us Indians as effeminate people. Uh, the kind of argument that Bankim Chandra Chatterjee made in a book called Krishna Charitra, for example, this is very much the kind of view that in some ways uh, Ambedkar really has. Now with this, I come to my second section, Buddha not Marx. Ambedkar's unequivocal affirmation of a modern religion. Now if I have established that Ambedkar was never far removed from the ideal of spiritual fulfillment, um, and that he sought to achieve this within the matrix of institutionalized religion. You see, which is why he's, the conversion is to Buddhism, okay? In some form or the other, what of his relationship to Marx? Um, he had a very complicated relationship to Marx, uh, with whose writings he had acquired a considerable familiarity as a student of Vladimir uh, Skimkovich at Columbia University in 1913, 1914. Uh, Simkovich is in fact a very interesting character because he actually writes a book called Marxism versus Socialism. Uh, and you can begin to see where Ambedkar is getting some of his ideas from. You know, if you, you look at the, think about the title of this book, that these are obviously in a commonplace discourse. We very often use it synonymously, but in fact that these are two separate entities in, in many ways. Uh, now Ambedkar continued his studies in economic history, social thought, and sociology over the years. And he accepted most of Marx's theses about the oppressive nature of capitalism and the inevitability, inevitability of class struggles, even if he found his ideas of historical materialism and what may be called the iron laws of history somewhat rigid uh, and overly determined by Marx's grounding in the history of the West. Um, there's been recent attempts to rescue Marx here by suggesting that what he knew of Asia was far more than what is called the Asiatic mode of production, but I'm not convinced, uh, personally speaking, by those arguments. Um, uh, you know, uh, but here, here again, that's a, a, a large and complicated set of questions. Uh, what is, I think, important here in trying to understand his relationship to, to Marx is the brute fact that as a Dalit, Ambedkar was assimilated to the experience of oppression from birth. Books could sharpen his understanding of humiliation, 
and exploitation and move him to explore what drove men to find satisfaction from and enjoyment from degrading others. But he knew firsthand, Ambedkar knew firsthand what it meant for a people to be born into poverty, reduced to indignity at every turn, thwarted in every endeavor to improve themselves and ground into the dust. Had Karl Marx been born in India and written his famous treatise Das Kapital, sitting in India, Ambedkar was to say he would have had to write in an entirely different fashion, end quote. Now the very first question that Ambedkar might have, of course, put to Marx would have been something like, how does the dictatorship of the proletariat contend with caste? Take an illustration of that. Kind. And of course, how does Marxist theory contend with the phenomenon called caste? And we know that Indian Marxism has worked this over for, for decades now, right? The late essay, Buddha or Karl Marx, offers a reader a keener sense of the shortcomings that he attributed to Marxism and the reasons for his attraction and conversion to Buddhism. Okay, all of this perforce also being the backdrop to his outlook on the history of Islam in India. We need to turn to this book only very briefly. What he does is he basically puts Marxism and its uh, kernel in what I might call the Four Noble Truths. All right, so transposed from Buddhism to Marxism, what are the Four Noble Truths of Marxism? That the function of philosophy is to reconstruct the world. Secondly, there is class conflict. Thirdly, the private proper ownership of property entails exploitation and sorrow. And lastly, as private property is a source of such sorrow, it must be abolished. All right, that is sort of, if I may put it this way, the way in which Ambedkar basically condenses it. Now then he has a very extensive critique of Marxism. Uh, very briefly, the, the first is that he critiques Marxism for its addiction to the idea of violence and to the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat. So violence and then the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, he suggests that the Buddha himself is committed to ahimsa. He makes a comparison with Mahavir. Okay, because of course you could have asked yourself, well, he, they could have converted to Jainis. Jainism, he didn't convert to Jainism. But he says that, well, the problem with Mahavir's ahimsa as opposed to the Buddha's uh, ahimsa is that Mahavir does not have the conception of force as creative energy. So he makes a distinction between force as violence, which is how the Marxists understand it, and then the Buddhist is the transformation of force into a certain form of creative energy, right? And of course, one of the things he says in, about the Buddha in this particular essay is that the Buddha was a person who was firmly democratic, firmly democratic. Um, now, I want to introduce at this point, a point which I was going to make later on, but since I think we, I want to wrap up in about 10, 15 minutes to leave some time for questions. I want to introduce that point at this juncture uh, rather than in the third section, which is that um, if you look at um, what Buddhism has to say about slavery, okay? What Ambedkar argues in his treatise, the Buddha and his Dhamma, is that the Buddha was a person who was entirely hospitable to slaves. Okay, so there are certain portions of the text. Um, if you're interested, I can give you the exact citations later on to these portions. Uh, and you know, for those of you who don't know, but the entire government of Maharashtra set of the writings and speeches of Ambedkar is available online in, in, in a PDF you know, uh, uh, format. All right, um, um, and in volume 11 of this is where you're going to find this particular work. Uh, the, the essence of what I want to say here is this, is that modern scholarship does not remotely corroborate Ambedkar's reading of the question of slavery and how Ambedkar understood it. Okay, and I could refer you in particular to the very extensive essays that have been written by Gregory Chopin. I know that some Dalits will say, ah, but that's a foreign scholar, he's biased, but I can refer you to uh, the, the works of Professor Srimali, uh, volume four in the, in, in the New People's History of India that's been published by Tulika Books, edited by Irfan Habib, where he has a withering critique of Buddhism's 
and the Buddha's own relationship to slavery. And the basic finding really is that there isn't a single monastic code which actually really permits the entry of former slaves into the Sangha. And you certainly cannot become a monk. Okay? You certainly cannot become a monk. That, that is really the argument that is uh, made and I think it's something to think about because when we look at Ambedkar's reading of um, Buddhism, um, I get the inescapable feeling that it is, if I may put it this way, an exceedingly benign kind of reading uh, of Buddhism. Uh, and finally, on, the, on this particular subject, um, I think uh, I want to uh, 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 sum up what I've said in this section by suggesting to you that Ambedkar says that, look, if you look at the formula, liberty, equality, and fraternity, he says, I derive this not from the French Revolution, and from the tracks of the French Revolution, I derive this from the teachings of the great master, the Buddha, right? Because what he argues here is that, look, the problem with classical liberal thought is it compromises on the question of equality. Communism, on the other hand, is dedicated to equality, but has little regard for liberty, right? And the three, liberty, equality, and fraternity, can only coexist and I'm quoting Ambedkar, if one follows the way of the Buddha, right? Now, third section, truncated greatly, Ambedkar's understanding of religion in the Indian past in a larger way, all right? Um, because it must be said that it is the specific, the historical specificity of Buddhism in India not the universalized history of Buddhism, right? That Ambedkar drew upon to make his final case for Buddhism and its attractiveness to Dalits, all right? And essentially, what are the arguments that the Dalits are? So this is in a book called Untouchables, uh, Who Were They and Why They Became Untouchables, published in 1948, uh, where he suggests that the Dalits are basically the Ur-Buddhists, so they are the basic, the originary Buddhists. Um, and in a way, the conversion would be a form of, if I may use the Hindutva phrase today, it would be a form of garvapsi. It would be a form of returning back to the bosom, okay, uh, of where they came from, right? And of course, a very different politics than the kind of garvapsi that has been embraced, as we know, by uh, the Hindutva people uh, over the last so many years, all right? Um, and one of the things that he argues very strongly there is that if you look at the history of Buddhism, it alone offered resistance to Brahmism, Brahmanism and had not succumbed to the hideous system of caste, all right? Now, does this mean that Ambedkar never doubted the suitability of Buddhism for Dalits? No, he did. He did doubt the suitability for a period of time. Uh, the fundamental, two fundamental considerations were one, the proximity of Buddhism to Hinduism. Okay, and, and there again, I could take you through the long journey of various, because if there are, there are speeches going back to the 1930s, where he's, he's, he's very attentive to this matter and he says, no, no, this is, the Hinduism is, you, you know, uh, uh, Buddhism is not an option uh, at all for the Dalits because most Hindus simply see the Buddhists as a form of Hindus anyhow. And, you know, it refers to, among many other things, the fact that, that the Buddha is, in some of the Puranic literature, viewed as an avatar of Vishnu, etc., etc. I think many of you are familiar with this line of argument, all right? Um, the second reason why he has reservations about the Buddhists not embracing okay, Buddhism, Buddhism, right? The Dalits not embracing Buddhism is because he says that, look, Islam is a universal religion. There is a conception of the Ummah. If a Muslim gets oppressed in India, he can shout. He'll be heard. There is an audience for him outside India. And it's the security of numbers. It is the security of numbers. 
He says the problem with being a Dalit and converting to Buddhism is he says Buddhism itself is a religion of obscurity. It has no clout in the modern world. And I have to say to you that one of the many reasons why Buddhism converts, which is an argument I can only give you in a very cryptic form, one of the many reasons why he converts to Buddhism is because eventually he accepts what I would call a liberal Western in interpretation of Buddhism as a language of intellectuals, as a religion of intellectuals, so to speak. Okay? In other words, what I'm suggesting to you that his understanding of Buddhism is greatly shaped by the invention of Buddhism as it's described by some in the late 19th century. And to understand that, we have to understand a long strand of European colonial scholarship on this particular question. All right? It is not possible for me to, at this point, to enter into the question of why he might not have converted to Christianity and Sikhism, but I can just mention two things very briefly before moving to the question of Islam. Uh, and one has to do with the fact that Ambedkar was keenly aware of the hostility of upper caste Christian converts and Sikh leaders to mass conversion. And the, the reason for this hostility had to do with the fear that this would lead in each case to the Dalitization of the faith. So there is a hostility among upper caste Sikh leaders and Christian converts, and, and he is very clear about that. And then, of course, there is a whole question of the, the contamination of caste within Indian Christianity and within Indian Sikhism. Right? That's another argument that he has. All right. Now, having said all of this, one might think that, well, perhaps he found Islam hospitable. Right? So Christian. Christianity has not much to recommend for it. Marx has been rejected. Sikhism has not much to recommend for itself. But no, he takes a very critical outlook towards Islam. And it's, and it's particularly interesting that his views start to become more pronounced in 1940, shortly after the passage of the so-called Pakistan Resolution, uh, the Lahore Resolution, which doesn't mention Pakistan as you know by name, but it's called the Pakistan Resolution, right? Because you might have thought, well, this is the time to lead my fellow Dalits to the promised land, right? That is that now there's a separate territory that might come about. I mean, not that anyone knew the design of it as, as such, but it's there on the cards. And if, and if numbers offer security, then well, obviously, that's a way to go, convert to Islam. But it must be said to, to Ambedkar's great credit that he's not a social Darwinist, unlike Savarkar, who's a complete social Darwinist, law of the jungle. That's his code, basically. Uh, they're very sophisticated, uh, allegedly sophisticated attempts to rescue Savarkar. He cannot be. We should be very clear about that. Okay? And, and Ambedkar is very clear about that. That, he's, that this is a form of social Darwinism for me to just rush headlong into, into Islam on, at this particular time, all right? So now the question is, how does he really view Islam? And what I want to suggest to you here is that Ambedkar has to begin with the fundamental question for him, and that question is how why, under what circumstances, did Buddhism disappear from the land of its birth? That is the first fundamental question that he really has to ask. And this is where his, his uh, understanding is, I would say, barely satisfactory to be charitable. Because if you try to understand why Buddhism disappeared from the land of its birth, you can think about the growing distance between the monks and the laity, the re-emergence of Hindu kingship, the shrinking, shrinking patronage for Buddhist monasteries, and incidentally, there was already some scholarly work on all of this. I mean, given how formidable a scholar Ambedkar was, there was already a body of work that was beginning to come out. 
okay? Um, of course, a popular Hindu view also has the defeat of the Buddhas in debates with the Shankaracharya as part of that. Um, and there's some credibility to that, but there's a whole host of reasons. He doesn't really get into that. If you look at uh, the, the most important essay that he writes on this question, uh, which is a chapter in a book called Revolution and Counter-Revolution in India, okay? And so there's a whole chapter there on the disappearance of, of Buddhism. Um, and why then did Buddhism disappear? There can be no doubt, and I'm quoting Ambedkar, that the fall of Buddhism in India was due to the invasions of the Muslims. Islam came out as the enemy of the boot, boot idol. Islam was destructive of Buddhism wherever it went. And Ambedkar quotes with approval the verdict of the British historian Vincent Smith. The furious massacre perpetrated in many places by Muslim invaders were more efficacious than orthodox Hindu persecutions and had a great deal to do with the disappearance of Buddhism in several provinces in India. Now he anticipates the objection that Islam was hostile as much to Brahmanism as it was to Buddhism. But far from falsifying the claim that the sword of Islam, because that's the thesis, it's a sword of Islam, was responsible for the evisceration of Buddhism, it only suggests that we need an interpretation, he says, that would render an account of the circumstances that permitted Brahmanism, but not Buddhism, to survive the onslaught of Islam. All right? Now, Ambedkar did not advert to the sword of Islam thesis lightly. This particular chapter that I have referred to from revolution and counter-revolution, from which this assessment has been drawn, speaks repeatedly of the Buddhist priesthood that perished by the sword. And I hear I'm quoting Ambedkar again. The greatest disaster, he says, that befell the religion of Buddha in India. Okay. Now he's going to amplify these thoughts in a book which comes out in 1940 called Pakistan or the Partition of India. Um, and what I want to do here is, I want to look at one passage. Okay, and suggest to you what some of the problems are. Just this one passage which some of his defenders have said, well, you know, it's always been quoted out of context, so I'll give you the whole passage. I'll first give you the fragment, and then I'll give you the rest of it, and then you can see what's really happening here, okay? So he says, and I'm quoting, the Muslim invaders, no doubt, no doubt, he adds, this is not my words, came to India singing a hymn of hate against the Hindus. End quote. Right? Now, I can tell you, by the way, that if a Hindu had advanced such an argument, he would immediately have been branded a communalist, a Hindutva, all of that. That is reading communalism back into the Indian past. Because as I tell my students in my history class, why is it that Mohammed of Ghazni went for Somnath? You know, because if you want to make a middle class Hindu, at least in North India, where I come from, enraged, all you have to do is mention Somnath, Muhammad of Ghazni, and you know, the whole face becomes red, right? So why did he go for Somnath? Well, one reason he went for Somnath is because there was no State Bank of India. You know, you go where the money is. This is the politics of conquest, not the politics of religion. We have to understand that. The same person who attacked Somnath leveled all the Shia shrines on the way, all of them. Just read the accounts. I mean, Mohammed of Ghazni is an equal opportunity employer, if I may put it this way. Okay? So the question is is Ambedkar able to distinguish the politics of conquest from the politics of religion? Because look at that phrase the, they came to India, no doubt, singing a hymn of hate against the Hindus. It's like bhakti oriyaya, you know? That's extraordinary. Now, do invaders act otherwise than what 
the Muslims did when they came, as Hegel would have said, in search of India's fabled wealth. All right. So, if the defender says now that look, this is being quoted out of context, let's look at the rest of the passage. All right. Because the question is, does the situation for Muslims, as he interprets them, actually improve? But, and I quote, they did not merely sing their hymn of hate and go back burning a few temples on the way. That would have been a blessing. That would have been a blessing. Well, we have to re read, what does he mean by that? They were not content with so negative a result. They did a positive act namely to plant the seed of Islam. Because, hey, that seed of Islam is being planted upon a barbarism. Because that's what Hindu caste society is. Right? Because had they simply looted and plundered, it would have been tolerable. Right? It would even have been a blessing. But no, they don't stop there. They plant the seed of another barbarism. So what is his reading? It's one Barbarism planted upon barbarism. That is effectively Ambedkar's reading. And I can tell you, if you look at the pages of this work, 1940, there are scores of passages where he simply excoriates Islam. And what is interesting to me and very puzzling to me, especially, is that he's not speaking about Islam in general. He's speaking about Indian Islam. Because today the view would be that if anything, Indian Islam was much, if I may use the word, softer. So for all of those like myself who believe very much in this Indo-Islamic cultural synthesis, which I think was one of the supreme achievements of civilization anywhere in the world, it's just not there in Ambedkar, not even a word of it. And he says very clearly, the Hindus and Muslims are two separate nations. We don't have to just think of Jinnah or the Hindu Mahasabha or whoever we think is responsible for the two nation theory. Okay. He is very clear that there is no notion of brotherhood in Islam which extends beyond Muslims, right? The brotherhood, he says, is very clearly for Muslims, and then he goes into an old whole analysis of the distinction between Darul Harb, Darul Islam, etc., etc. All right. So I basically end there because I could go on in this in this vein ad infinitum, but I think what I want to suggest to you very briefly is that we need to take a very critical perspective, not simply on what he's saying about Islam, a very critical understanding of what Ambedkar's understanding of religion is. And even his understanding of the very religion that he eventually embraced. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before we go to the audience, uh, let me ask you, sir, if I got it right from what you have just said, uh, the conversion itself was a kind of uh, returning to the older tradition, something like that you said, right? Is that right? It was like a Gavapasi in that time? Is that right? One of many things. Not, not, it wasn't the only thing, because then that's why he calls it the Navayana too, if it's only the return, uh, because he is trying to, what he does is, he creates not simply a new set of rituals, but he creates a new Buddhist canon. Okay, he creates a new Buddhist canon, which he think is more responsive to the questions of modern times. See, because for him, there is also the question of whether a religion is compatible with modernity. And his view is that Buddhism is the religion which is most compatible with modern civilization because Buddhism is a religion which is largely rational and scientific in outlook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And one more thing, sir, it was the conversion itself was a kind of escapism from the a uh, caste-ridden Hindu society, right? So was it uh, not at all a concern for him that the, the Buddhism itself uh, was on a decline in the land of its origin? Uh, that yeah. didn't matter? No, no. You see, in fact, in fact, I'm trying to suggest is that you see, escape is not just the word we want to use. Because th that's why I began by suggesting 
that for him the idea of spiritual fulfillment is very important and this spiritual fulfillment must be within the matrix within the parameters of an institutionalized religion you see so this is not for him a form of escapism but of course it's very clear that as i've said to you and as we both as all of us know that that he says very clearly that i was born a hindu but i'm not going to die a hindu you know i think we can take some questions from the audience as we are short of time please make it brief it's a request please just uh, two questions yes. i guess do you please. think uh, the success of the pune pact because of the yeah. 21 day starvation uh, yeah. which uh, mahatma gandhi did did ambedkar take it very personally as his personal defeat and what happened after that was a result of that yeah well i mean look i mean you know there has been a kind of a consensus uh, i i'm not sure i accept the consensus for the uh, necessarily but the but the the view for a long time has been that ambedkar viewed what happened at the time of the pune pact as an illustration of the extraordinarily coercive abilities of mohandas gandhi that this was this was the devious gandhi at at his worst or at his best all right um and did he take it personally i think there's no question that he did i think he, i think i th he took it as an affront certainly to the dalits so i would want to say that well yes i mean i think he took it personally you know there's an interview that was done with him by bbc shortly before he died and if you read that interview which is actually on youtube it's very interesting what he has to say there because you can see the bitterness is still there it's lingering there and this is more than you know several years after the assassination of gandhi right the bitterness is lingering there but but i think you know ambedkar is a man of great stature in his own way so i think that we should be sure that we don't simply reduce this to a matter of where he took it personally i think he took it as an affront to the dalits and to the whole idea of what we might call a certain kind of autonomy of dalit space you see so that's essentially how i would view it and what happens your second question has to do with what happens later on i mean i think that in fact one of the consequences of the pune pact was that it actually helped in consolidating consolidating the leadership of of ambedkar I mean one of the circumstances that we have to understand is that 1932 at the time of Gandhi's fast the dalit leadership was not as uniformly behind ambedkar as it was going to become later on and i think the pune pact had a role to play in that but that that would be the brief answer yeah. one final question please hello Yes, who is that? Okay. Uh, are you accusing um, Dr. Ambedkar's view as a direct reason for the disappearance of Buddhism in India? Am I accusing Ambedkar's view? Accusing? What do you mean? Accusing Ambedkar's view as a direct? I, um, I don't. I don't understand what what you mean by the question, really. Let me rephrase it. Are you assuming? Assuming. Uh, assuming. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Ambedkar's views on Buddhism as yeah. a direct reason for the disappearance of Buddhism in India. No, no. What I what I'm trying to suggest is I'm sim I'm providing a reading of how Ambedkar understands the disappearance of Buddhism. All right. How does he understand the disappearance of Buddhism? You know, for example, there's been a very interesting question. Um, Professor Padmanabh Jaini was. one scholar among others who actually looked at the question of how is it that at that time jainism was able to was able to continue and buddhism was not and then of course it had to do with a number of questions it had to do with questions of for example that in the gangetic okay uh, plains uh, the the uh, buddhism had a far greater importance than jainism did for example but it also had to do as he points out with very complicated questions such as the relationship between the laity okay and the monks and one of the things he found out was that in jainism there is a much more if i may put it this way well established order 
for understanding these relationships. The relationships were much closer. In Buddhism, the, the relationships have become much more distant. Then there's a whole question of patronage systems, as I pointed out, right? I mean, I couldn't spell out all of these things, but that one of the reason, one of the consequences for the decline of Buddha, one of the reasons for the decline of Buddhism had to do with the, the fact that the patronage for Buddhism began to shrink. The, the ascendancy of Hindu kingship. So that's what I'm trying to do, is I'm trying to understand right, what Ambedkar's reasoning is. And what's interesting is that much of this does not enter into that reasoning. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank There's you, a, sir. Show the question that she had, Professor. You, okay, please. Final question. So the presumably very controversial passage that you were citing, yeah. which you cited in support of the reasons why Ambedkar was not, um, you know, didn't find Islam congenial. Um, but, but if he had been interested in converting to Islam, then those facts wouldn't have mattered, right? No, but you, look, I mean, the first thing is that we can't, we can't talk about contrafactuals, okay? What I'm suggesting is let's, let's engage in the hermeneutic exercise. How does one interpret a passage like this? Okay? So the first step is to understand that we have to make a distinction between the politics of conquest and the politics of religion. Does Ambedkar make that distinction? He does not. That is a fatal problem. It's a fatal problem. This, this passage could have come out of 500 colonial histories exactly, right? It could have come out of 500 colonial histories. Now, some of his defenders have said that, look, the, only this portion of the passage is, so I take the rest of the paragraph then and say, okay, what does he say after that? What is his understanding? Because the word when he says, ah, that would have been a blessing had this, no, but they had to blunt. They didn't just come, raid and then leave. They stayed. Yeah? I, I can't hear you. Yeah. So there's already Islamophobia in the passage. But you see, I, I haven't used the word, you noticed. Because it has its own politics. And the question is whether I want to have my views absorbed into that, because which is why I place it within the larger context of his religious outlook. Right? This is, you see, which is why this, there, there is a kind of positivism in Ambedkar that I regret to say almost no scholar has seriously looked at. Right? And that positivism very much accounts for the kind of views that he develops what portion of orientalist scholarship he accepts and doesn't accept, all of this would have to be taken very seriously because Ambedkar's scholarship is, I would say, at a very rudimentary stage at this point in time. Very rudimentary stage, you know, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It was a fantastic session. And thank you, sir. On behalf of KLF and people of Cold Court, I thank you very much.